Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Today, our special guest on Lyme Time is Dr. David Weil. For 20 years, Dr. Weil served as the director of several transplant programs, and he kept with him a list of names of people who were in dire need of lung transplants. Most notably, as the former director of the Center for Advanced Lung Disease and Lung and Heart Lung Transplant Program at Stanford University Medical Center, he led a team of 55 plus people, and he was in charge of the care plan for transplant patients, assessing their psychological chances for survival and matching them with the organs as they became available. In 2016, after serving in his role at Stanford for 11 years, Dr. Weil did the unthinkable, and he walked away while at the top of his field. He was burnt out from the daily battles and emotional roller coaster of being a doctor, with the patients that couldn't be treated because of finances, the operations that failed, and the countless hours spent trying to make the modern miracle of organ transplants a bit more miraculous. Dr. Weil is currently the principal of the Weil Consulting Group, which is a consultancy that specializes in helping medical teams perform better and improve the delivery of pulmonary ICU and transplant care. He is also the author of the riveting memoir, Exhale, Hope Healing in a Life in Transplant, which offers readers an inside look at the immense psychological pressure medical professionals face on the job today and the toll a career in transplants took on one of the nation's most successful transplant doctors. Dr. Weil has twice testified before the U.S. Senate about how various inhaled occupational exposures affect lung health, appeared before various state legislatures, and lectured extensively nationally and internationally at major medical conferences and academic medical centers. Additionally, he has authored many book chapters, editorials, and medical articles, which have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, LA Times, and the Chicago Tribune, to name a few. Dr. Weil has also been interviewed by major media outlets, including Fox, CNN, the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, the Wall Street Journal, and the Doctor's TV show, to name a few. So, Although Dr. Weil has not, uh, does not specialize in treating Lyme disease patients, nor has he had Lyme disease, I wanted to get an inside look at some of those pressures that the doctors are facing when they see patients and when they enter the room, and also give you, as the Lyme patient, uh, the better chance at having a voice with your own personal doctor and making the experience just a little um, a little more smooth. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. David Weil. Thank you for having me. I look forward to it. All right. So we know that you're um, you've you have experience in treating patients with Lyme disease, but today we're really going to focus on the aspect of our patients and our brave warriors out there who have gone and been bounced around from doctor to doctor, and typically blood work uh, at first glance is very in line, kind of perfect, nothing really jumping out, but these people are experiencing extreme pain, neurological symptoms, things that they just can't deny and they need answers. So oftentimes we, we encounter something that I call, you know, sort of like medical fatigue or doctor fatigue. Um, I know for me, myself, I, it took me six years to find the correct path. And once I did, and once I had actual lab work to work with, I could go in the right direction. But for those six years, it was very painful. I felt very isolated. I felt confused. I felt not heard by the medical community and oftentimes were, was very dismissed uh, living in Los Angeles where Lyme disease, they, they don't think 
it really exists to a certain degree. And of course we know it does, but it, it was a very frustrating experience. So I'd like to start out with you, doctor, um, talking about just, you know, first and foremost, coping with, with a chronic illness or a serious health event and, um, and, and what the patient goes through in terms of being overwhelmed and riding waves of difficult emotions. What do you see um, your patients come in with and, and what are some of your favorite coping tools from a doctor's perspective? Yeah, I appreciate the comments you made because I think there are instances of extreme frustration with the medical system, even when there's no diagnostic problem. In other words, I treated a lot of patients. We knew exactly what they had. They had chronic diseases and you know that's one category. But I think with Lyme disease in particular, and I've, he I've heard this a lot, I've read about this uh, you know, a great deal. I think there's that instance where the medical profession doesn't know, you know what a patient has and there's no treatment plan for it. And there's sometimes even denial that, you know, there's a medical problem at all. And isn't this all in your head? And I think that that's a different level of frustration. I really do, because I think our medical system, I think works best when it, we, we all as patients have a disease that's in the box that we know what to do for. The insurance companies seem to do better with those kinds of diseases. Doctors right. and nurses seem to do better with those kinds of diseases, but Lyme disease does not fit into that category. And I've heard so many times before in the past where went from doctor to doctor, no one really knew what was wrong with an individual patient. And then they finally found the doctor who made the diagnosis. So, you know, one, one, I think important part of it is not to give up, to trust yourself, to trust that you actually know that something's wrong, that you know your body well, and be dogged in the pursuit of it. I think that there's also, um, you know, the notion that knowledge, you know, is power. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even though there's no internet search, it's going to substitute good medical judgment. I think sometimes good medical judgment, frankly, is hard to find. You know, I think doctors are in a hurry and sometimes, you know, they don't think deeply about what's wrong with an individual patient. So a patient has to essentially become their own advocate. And I think that that's, that's really important. I would also say that in becoming your own advocate, just make sure that your family and friends around you know that, you know, you need, you need help you need help and navigating the medical system, um, talking to the insurance companies, making appointments, following up on lab results, all that stuff is pretty work intensive. I'm sure I don't have to tell your audience that. And I think that the more people you can get involved, the less isolating the medical problem will feel like. Mm, those are great. That, that's great information. Uh, yeah, you know, you talk about being just pursuant in your quest and it's pretty um it's pretty tough especially in those beginning stages when you can barely get out of bed to go in and and have somebody say you know um you know you finally wait six months to get into the neurologist or whatever and and they're realizing there's a problem but they haven't quite they don't like you said don't have all the answers yet and so i'm sure that you in your business and your practice you you oftentimes deliver not so great news to your patients. And I'm wondering what you do tell them um, in your business when um, they're faced with something like this. And obviously they're in shock and disbelief, I'm sure at, at first, but what's your advice as you send them home and before their next appointment? You know, I think the most important thing is to be truthful and transparent and to make sure that a patient understands what I know about their disease. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that there is a tendency to maybe beat around the bush a little bit and sugarcoat medical information. And 
I think it's done out of love in a way, because I think, you know, there's, there's, there's a, the notion that you're really protecting the patient, but I think in the long run, it's better to, to tell patients what we know about their medical condition rather than, than keep that information to ourselves. Because I think the more patients understand about it, the better they're, they're going to be, you know, in the long run. I, I think that while those conversations are very difficult to have, they're the ones that are, uh, I think, gut-wrenching in so many ways. I think they're the ones that also connect you to the patient better. You know, those are the ones that really make for a, a close doctor-patient relationship, especially when the patient feels like we as physicians are telling them the absolute unvarnished truth. Yeah. It's got to be a tough position that you're in. And, and oftentimes we forget that as a patient, you know. Um, what can you tell our listeners about how they can be best prepared to come in for an appointment? As you said, doctors are oftentimes in a hurry. They are deal, deal even though they're dealing with very serious issues. Um, what gives you the best outcome of an appointment with a patient in terms of what they bring to the table? You know, I think there's a few tips for that doctor patient encounter that I would provide to your listeners. I think the first thing is come in prepared. Mm -hmm. In other words, actually write it out the most important issues to you because the doctor is going to be time compressed. That, that's that's almost 100 percent. Right. I think anybody that's been to the physician uh, lately uh, would say that. So write it out be methodical one two three four about the questions you ask and the answers you get i would say the second piece of advice was is don't go alone mm -hmm. uh, bring a spouse bring a family member bring a friend because it is amazing how many times i've delivered news to patients and they they have absolutely heard <laughs> one thing and a family member has has heard another thing and i think it's important because when you go home from your doctor's meeting, oftentimes you'll ask yourself, did I hear that right? Um, did, did, did he or she say X? And sometimes the spouse will say, no, they said Y. They said something completely different. So I would say, if you can, bring somebody with you to check that. And then the final thing I would say, and, and patients are doing this more and more now since the advent of the iPhone, really, which I guess it's been 15 years now, is record the session. Yeah, uh, I just I think out of courtesy, ask the physician if it's okay if you do that. Uh, they're going to say, yeah, that's fine. Um, but I think recording the session is really important because, again, if you don't think you heard something right when you go home, you can actually hear it again. It's so true. I, I've done that myself. And uh, I don't think the doctors mind at all because it probably saves them, you know, six follow-up calls That's after. Right. And it's all, often great to just record it even on your iPhone if you're by yourself. And I think that's important um, for everyone to, to know just there's so much information coming in and out and you want to be the best patient as you can, of course, because you want the best doctor. Um, and I know that you have probably been working overtime during this latest pandemic um, in your field with lung transplants. Um, but I wanted to know, um, you know, after it's, uh, you know, now that the dust is sort of settling a little and, and you're kind of coming out of it, knowing a lot more than you did, obviously, a few years ago, what has that experience taught you just kind of going through that with your patients? What have what has the last few years brought to you in terms of what have you gained from that experience as a as a physician and as a person in general? Wow, I mean, great question, but also one that's very difficult to answer because almost everything's different now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we all went through this. We we saw some things about healthcare that were intensely disappointing. And we saw some things about medical science that were miraculous. And I would say the, the very fast development of the vaccine is one of the most amazing things I've seen in, in the course of my medical career, I truly. 
But I've also seen a healthcare system that ha was exposed. It, it was exposed for the problems that it's had, whether it's um, the economic incentives of the healthcare system, and those are still re it's still resonating throughout hospitals right now. Hospitals are still grappling with the things that occurred during the pandemic, and most notably staffing. You know how to keep nurses in the hospital and employed, <laughs> have enough of them. Yeah. But I also think that probably the most lasting effect of the pandemic will be the divide between the patients and the people that we took care of. In other words, there's been, I think, a, a bonding effect among the clinicians but a divide when it came to the patients and the healthcare providers because so much got politicized about the pandemic. Uh, medical disinformation was at an all-time high. There was a loss of trust between the doctors and, and the people they were caring for. Those that didn't take the vaccine, for instance, or those that didn't do the best they could to protect themselves. I think with, I think the trust broke down, frankly. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's going to be not impossible to regain, but it's going to take some time. So what I hope will happen also is that there'll be a building of the public health infrastructure so that we can do better next time. I'm not convinced that is happening, but I, but, but that's my hope. Yeah, and I think, you know, for the Lyme patients, every year in the United States, there are a new uh, number of cases to the tune of 500,000 and annually. It's wow. just gotten out of control. And, um, and you know, new and vector-borne bacterial infections are becoming... Um, they're being variated a, a lot. So in other words, you know, we're having, we're just noticing two more strains, you know, even just this summer. And so even though it might not be Lyme disease, it may be another um, co-infection of that sort. And it, it just takes a lot of work on the side of the medical teams as well. I know um, the loss of trust can often come to, to our patients after a series of being referred, bounced around, and not getting answers to their questions. And I think uh, your advice is great. Just don't lose hope. Continue in your pursuit. It's okay to have medical fatigue every once in a while. I, I myself took a few months off between, you know, at a couple of points in my journey. And um, and to just, it should just have hope. And once you get a Lyme disease diagnosis, you can treat it allopathically as well as, you know, with an integrative physician. And so I would hope that, you know, our medical doctors that are our Western medical doctors can also in the future know to refer uh, just a patient to maybe an integrative doctor that might be able to help search even deeper and find some more of the root causes uh, that we're all looking for. Um, you know, it takes a team. I have I have four medical doctors on my team, and I was grateful to find them. It took me some time, but I just really, you know, I really think that I would like to say to you on behalf of all of the patients out there who are um, facing serious challenges in their health, and that came on suddenly and unexpectedly that we just want to collectively say thank you to you uh, for, you know, continuing your own pursuit of them in the medical field. Um, can you tell our patients a little bit about your clinic and where it's located and how, um, people are referred to you? Yeah. So I work, um, I work largely in the transplant arena. So my, um, I spent most of my career at Stanford where I ran the lung transplant program there and the, the Center for Advanced Lung Disease. But now I'm a healthcare consultant. So what I do now is help transplant programs and pulmonary care and ICU care in hospitals where those areas are underperforming. And so I, I, I work 
with programs sometimes for a few months, sometimes for several years uh, to improve their programs. And so I'm a clinical program um, consultant really um, is, the, is the best way I do it. I also spend a good deal of time you know, writing right now so that I can get my message out um, to anybody that you know is interested. And you know, that's really how I spend my day. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I, I think that um, you, you really remind us in a nice and gentle way how hard our physicians are working on our behalf and, and how great institutions like Stanford are continuing their research on tick-borne illness and, and, um, and just that um, to, to not lose hope out there, everyone, that uh, just stay true to that, that, you know, Harvard is also working very hard in Northwestern mm -hmm. and, and all these great institutions, John Hopkins, uh, in order to bring us more answers in the future. So thank you so much for your time.